So this will be fun. Now, our patrons and listeners of our podcast, Bonsai Podcasts, right? We have a podcast. Already know that for a while we've been working on a full length Roroni Kenshin video that's going to be a lot like our Trigon video and our Dodo Hedero video. And we're really excited to put it out. However, as you can tell from the title of this video, there's definitely going to be some challenges. Now I'm going to assume the majority of you know what I'm going to be discussing in this video, but for those of you who don't, prepare for a pretty nasty awakening to stuff that has to do with your favorite manga and anime and kind of Japan as a whole. Sorry in advance. However, I'd like to assure you that this is not another clickbait takedown of Kenshin. In fact, I love Roroni Kenshin. It is one of my favorite stories of all time, period. As if you couldn't tell from the other videos that we've done on the subject. And I know a lot of other people feel the same way, which makes bringing up this topic so difficult. That said, there is an incredible amount of intricacies within the criminal case of Nobuhiro Watsuki that deserve to be explored. And not just for fans of Kenshin, but also for detractors as well. Now, originally this whole subject was going to be part of the upcoming video. However, we decided that not only was it going to mess up the content that we were planning on making, but it really deserved and necessitated its own video and discussion. So before we start, the problems that we are going to address in this video are going to require an open mind. So I would hope that everybody can just try to be as objective as possible as we go through this. We're going to be looking at this through a political, sociological, anthropological, and historical lens to do our best to lay out the entire situation for everybody. So take a deep breath. Let's get started. So for a lot of Western anime fans that are around my age, Ravoni Kenshin was probably one of the first series you got into in the late 90s, early 2000s. It's got the samurai, it's got the fighting, it's got dudes with crazy swords, it's got cool characters, and definitely a banger of an opening. Ravoni Kenshin is, without a doubt, one of the all-time greats. And then afterwards, a lot of us would go on to read the manga, where we would form a parasocial relationship with mangaka Nobuhiro Watsuki. Now, within the pages of his books, he would often speak pretty candidly with the audience. He'd educate us on the subject material of Roroni Kenshin. It is a historical drama, so there's a lot of things that kind of need explanations as you go through. He would also talk about things like inspirations for his characters, uh, what manga he was reading, what anime he was enjoying, what video games he was playing. And there's other mangaka that do this, but out of every manga that I've ever read, I think that Nobuhiro Watsuki uh, left the biggest impression on me. He seemed like a, a relatable and genuinely kind person. Uh, his story itself was very positive. It's uh, it's about Kenshin, who is a man raised to be an assassin, and then later in life uh, walks the path of peace in order to bring himself personal redemption. So in that way, Kenshin is a character to be admired. He's somebody to look up to. He's somebody who does everything in his power to continue to walk the path that he finds to be the, the best way through life while the rest of the world is constantly trying to drag him into their conflicts. The manga became a cultural touchstone. It's a work of historical fiction, but most importantly, it's a message to the reader to not give up, to be a good person and find happiness in life, that you can change and that the past doesn't define who you are. Now, while Watsuki was creating Kenshin in the 90s, he was also mentoring mangaka that would go on to change the face of the art form. This includes Echiro Oda, the man who made One Piece, as well as Hideyuki Take, the mangaka of Shaman King, and many more. His legacy fundamentally shaped the future of manga and anime in the East, but more specifically and more importantly here in the West. And then in 2017, at age 47, Nobuhiro Watsuki was tried and convicted for having a literal horde of adult videos starring people that are way too young to be in them. Juveniles. You understand what I'm saying, it's bad. For his conviction, he was charged the equivalent of $1,500 and served no jail time. The next year, he resumed publication of the sequel to Roroni Kenshin, the Hokkaido arc, which is still ongoing today. And he also seems to be involved in the creation of the Roroni Kenshin remake of the old anime that is premiering as of the creation of this video. So whether this is new information to you or not, you're probably upset and confused. I mean, it, how did 
somebody with this much illicit material end up with a small fine and no jail time? The answer is very complicated and obviously uncomfortable, but that's what this video is for to help people understand. So a lot of what I'm about to get into may seem irrelevant on the surface, but I promise everything here is very important. Uh, so if this is something that you're interested in, I would recommend paying attention. Now, what I find really interesting is, uh, especially in this case, the setting of Kenshin, which takes place in the early Meiji era, which is essentially the fulcrum of modern Japan. It is the turning point. So up until the 1800s, Japan was a feudal society, which means that essentially there was a power structure that was class oriented. You had your lords, you had your vassals, you had your samurai class, which were like the knights, and obviously you had your peasants and stuff like that. This is very old school stuff. The previous 300 years, which was known as the Edo period, it's something you've probably heard of, it definitely had a bit of like an artistic renaissance and, and things were better, but for the peasants, at least, things were very difficult. And the samurai, because they weren't warring all the time, were kind of thugs. Not only that, but up until the very late 1800s, they were still walking around primarily with swords. Japan was also still as isolationist as possible. It rejects foreign culture, foreign intervention, foreigners in general, until America showed up with big giant ships and cannons like Japan had never seen and basically threatened them to open their borders, which they did. And then after a real life civil war that takes place before Rurouni Kenshin, which again, 1878, Japan went from a feudal society to a modern state in about 30 years. And by 1904, the isolated island that was left behind by the rest of the world was able to not only go toe to toe with Russia in a war, but completely humiliate them. This war was called the Russo-Japanese War, and it's arguably the first instance of modern warfare. About 15 years later in World War I, the Japanese fought on the Allied side against the Axis powers, but were denied a spot in the League of Nations because they were Asian. This left them feeling angry and isolated from the rest of the world, so they decided to find resources for the rapid modernization elsewhere. Now that eventually led into the invasion of China in the 30s, which was really, really bad. You just look it up. I'll put a video link right here if you want to see stuff about that. Then Japan allied with Hitler, tried to take over the uh, Asian Pacific and went to war with America, a war that they provoked. And during this time period, the Japanese military did horrible, unspeakable things, not only to other soldiers, but uh, to civilians, lots of civilians. It's not as well known as the Nazi Holocaust, but it's definitely on even footing, just different. And while we can easily look at Hitler and understand how he used racism and fear and fascism in order to kind of manipulate people into committing all these crimes against humanity and covering up the worst ones and, you know, taking control of Germany, what was the deal with Japan? Now, the full answer to that is incredibly complicated. It would take me like 30 videos to explain it all. So instead, I recommend if you're interested in the Japanese side of World War II, that you check out Dan Carlin's podcast, Hardcore History, Supernova in the East. But what we can look at here is what we've already discussed. So again, Japan was a feudalist society until the late 1800s. European feudalism ended in 1500. That's about 400 years before Japan modernized. After European feudalism in 1500 CE, it was replaced by absolute monarchies, which is a centralized power system which united an entire country and had a centralized currency. This leads to a capitalistic economy, which led to constitutional monarchy, then to aristocracy, which led to oligarchy, which through much head chopping and rebellion ended in widespread constitutional democracy i.e. publicly elected leaders in a representative government with a national constitution. It's what we have here in America, and it took over 400 years to spread. Japan did this in 22 years. And naturally, it wasn't perfect. I mean, how could it be? The country was finally united, but the people of Japan had their entire lives flipped upside down. They went from local lords and fiefdoms to being able to vote in like less than a generation. While the country itself continued to modernize, it did so without fundamentally changing the traditions and morals of the Japanese people. So for Japan, World War II was fought 
more like an ancient war, just with science and modern weaponry. They were incredibly brutal because they were run by an outdated samurai honor code. While their borders were opened less than 100 years ago, they still saw the rest of the world as extremely alien, oftentimes to the point of other people being subhuman, and they treated them as such. They took no prisoners, they fought to the death, and as long as they felt that their actions, this is individual soldiers, were for the betterment of Japan, they pretty much had free reign without any permission from superiors. Now, if you're not thinking about that, uh, there's a lot of gray area in my actions are for the betterment of my nation. You can just look at the American Nazis for examples of that. I'd like to point out again that all of this is relevant. So just I'm cooking. OK, let me cook. So then after all of this, the Americans decided to test their nuclear bombs on Japan. And when I say test, I mean test. It was not a necessary action for them to take. The people of Japan were on their last legs and ready to give up. We knew for a fact that if we tried to force Japan into an unconditional surrender that they would never do it. There had to be at least one condition and we abused that knowledge in order to give us an excuse to drop those bombs. In a hundred years, Japan went from an isolationist feudal society to a modern power able to go toe to toe on a global scale to ashes. The nation was invaded, occupied, and Americanized both politically and economically. War crimes that Japan committed were covered up, erased out of textbooks, specifically because, uh, you know, America privatized the textbooks industry, so the textbooks were able to write basically whatever they wanted in history. Again, kind of our fault. But the country moved forward. The country moved forward, but the people were kind of left behind. They lost the war, they were confused, they were gaslit by the government and forced to pick up the pieces. 20 years after the end of that war, Nobuhiro Watsuki was born. Now, before we go any farther, I want to make it clear that the people of Japan, right, your average citizens, were more or less ignorant of what was going on in the bigger picture during World War II. They were extremely patriotic, uh, for sure, but because of propaganda, government-controlled media, and an all-around lack of communication, they really had no idea what was going on. And yes, they hated America and Americans, but that was because of propaganda that basically made them think that if we showed up, we were going to eat their babies. And I'd also like to reiterate that this is not a takedown of Japan, okay? World War II was the worst war of all time, and war crimes, crimes against humanity, were perpetrated by all sides. My intention in sharing this information is to specifically express how entirely unique Japan's view of this war and the world and the rest of the people in it were at this time. So we're back here, right? It's been only 133 years since Japan's first election. While the country has become a technological powerhouse and the number one place for animation and comic books, its people are still relatively isolated and on top of that, they're not really taught a lot of their own history, specifically the stuff that happened in the 20th century. A lot of their history books go, we did this stuff and then from 1930 something to the end of the war, nothing, all of a sudden the Americans dropped the atomic bombs on us. Their cultures have changed, but old traditions still remain. To most of us, Japan seems like this futuristic mecca with all this neat culture and fun things, video games, you name it. But socially, it's still incredibly far behind even conservative America. So if you remember before, I talked about the progression from feudalism to modern day society. Japan didn't have any of those progressions. They jumped from feudalism straight into 20th century power. But if we look back into some of the norms of a feudalistic society, we're going to see some things that we don't really like. For instance, child brides. Uh, back then, marriage was a contract. Marrying off your daughter, regardless of her age, to a wealthy man guaranteed a solid dowry. Marriage was a financial and social institution. And even with modernization, you still had cases of people like Edgar Allan Poe, who in the 1800s married his 13-year-old cousin. Yeah, he got some bombastic side eye, but in the end, nobody really cared. Now, through modern child psychology, it's become a duh aspect of civilization that children shouldn't be married off early or engage in marital activities at a young age. I mean, never mind the fact that that's extremely unappealing to the vast majority of people. But the better we understand the brain, the better we understand that the damage 
uh, that young people can incur while being forced into these kinds of situations uh, can ruin the rest of their lives. Now, psychology is not super big in Japan. The Japanese, they tend to be polite, uh, though they really hate it when you say that. So l let me rephrase. They don't like to be a bother. They really don't like to stick out and they hate creating problems for other people. Now, this has lent to Japan being a very clean and safe country, but it's also led to some major issues. For instance, the police are incredibly slow to react. In the mid 90s, a cult going by Om Shinrikyo, which I definitely recommend looking up because they're insane, committed multiple crimes, including murder, that could have easily been solved, but they were barely investigated or even reported. Due to this, the cult was able to use sarin gas to commit an act of terrorism on the public transit system in Japan. And to further emphasize my point about the Japanese people not wanting to be a bother, many people were seen dying from the gas, but still dutifully trying to make their way to work. Now, this not wanting to be a bother thing also can kind of push it to not wanting other people to be a bother either. So after America tested their shiny new bombs in World War II, the victims of Hiroshima and Nagasaki were spurned from society. This included cancer patients, amputees, burn victims. The physical deformities of the victims of the bombs made people uncomfortable. So essentially, nobody wanted to deal with them and also nobody was supposed to survive those bombs. People didn't know what radiation was going to do, so there was also a lot of rumors about radiation poisoning uh, being contagious forever. Another instance of Japan uh, kind of taking, not wanting other people to be a bother to an extreme was their eugenics program, which existed until 1996. Uh, some of the things that it did was sterilize people with physical or mental disabilities or force abortions on them. That stopped again in 1996. I was five. So between outdated views on individual liberty and uh, social etiquette, making changes in Japan is very difficult. People don't want to talk about things that make other people uncomfortable, so they just don't. And this isn't only in the political forum. It's, it's very uncommon for two Japanese people to tell each other how they actually feel unless they are very, very, very close. And even then, it's not super common. So when you watch an anime and you find yourself like banging your head against the wall being like all of these stupid problems could have been fixed if these two characters just talked to each other, that's your Western mind projecting onto the content. To the Japanese, these scenarios make a lot of sense. This is something that could happen because of the way that they're socialized. For another example of simply not wanting to talk about it, you may have noticed that Japanese uh, doujinshi, for example, is censored, at least the good parts of it are. Um, the government doesn't actually care about that anymore, but nobody wants to be the guy who stands up in parliament and says, hey, why don't we uncensor the doujinshi? So given all of this context, uh, the, the kind of way far behind social uh, stuff, the crazy rapid modernization of this country. I mean, we're talking skipping like 400 years of government growth. Uh, it may or may not surprise you that the illicit material that Nobuhiro Watsuki got caught with in 2017 was only made illegal three years prior in 2014. So until 2014, possession of this material was legal. That means you could have as much as you want. That means culturally, it wasn't a big deal. To the Japanese, it was just a creepy fetish. Obviously, I'm not Japanese. I wasn't raised with those norms. To me, it's revolting and wrong and obviously criminal. It's also illegal here and illegal for good reasons. The future damage being done to the young people in these videos is heinous. Now, while ownership of this material was made illegal in 2014, it wasn't until 1999 that the creation, production, and distribution of this material was made illegal. So that means until 1999, you could walk into a store in Japan and pick this stuff up off the shelves or make it yourself. How libertarian. So given all this information, I think it's a good time to stop and reflect, right? How many manga and anime have you enjoyed between the first ever created 
and the ones made before 2014. For me, it's literally hundreds. Many of the mangaka, animators, writers, content creators of all sorts over there were active and active primarily before 1999, let alone before 2014. A time when not only was this illicit material legal to buy, legal to own, even legal to make, but kind of normal. Obviously, this should raise some flags. It raises questions. It raises concerns. Where there's smoke, obviously there's fire. There's no way that Nobuhiro Watsuki is the only person that had these problems. In fact, he 100% wasn't. Lollicon didn't just pop out of nowhere. And to give a little bit more context, Japan needed to basically be bullied aggressively by the rest of the world to make this stuff illegal. And even to this day, fictional depictions of it in manga and cartoons are still legal. And that's part of the reason the internet is a horrible place. And to this day, we still have plenty of entertainment coming out of Japan where the lolly trope is a gag. But obviously, for some, it was more than that. However, in the eyes of the Japanese, or at least otaku culture, being a lolly con or being into the lolly scene makes you more of a pervert than a predator. So now that we know all the facts and history, why is it that Watsuki only got slapped with a little fine and, uh, you know, that's it? Of course, this is complicated as well. A Japanese law says that the maximum penalty for the same crime that Nobuhiro Watsuki committed is $10,000 USD and one year in jail. That is the maximum penalty. The severity of the penalty that you receive is obviously up to the judge and given the evidence that uh, is in court. In this case, the punishment for Nobuhiro Watsuki was the equivalent of $1,500. Now, given his uh, large collection, I don't know what would constitute the maximum fine, but I imagine that the situation obviously had a lot to do with the fact that the law was very new, and I find it even more likely that Watsuki was used as a warning. As I discussed earlier, Nobuhiro Watsuki is a very influential person. He's won multiple awards, he's tutored some of the best mangaka to ever live. People know who he is, especially in Japan, so showing everybody that nobody is safe from the law is really important. This also may have been used to prove to the rest of the world that Japan is taking this seriously. Look, see, we got a famous guy, aren't we woke now? And this is one of the things that I hear all all the time from people who are all outraged about this entire situation is that, you know, he only got this small fine and was able to go back to work. But we have to take into consideration as well Japan's stance on crime and punishment. As an average citizen in Japan, some like not a criminal, just a regular person, shame is the worst thing that can happen to you. It is drilled into you from birth to conduct yourself in a way that is helpful, pleasant, and beneficial to society. Severe punishment can come in the form of something as simple as a disapproving look from another person. And I'm dead serious, just a look. I mean, if you see the faces on the people in those Jake Paul videos, for instance, when he's running around like an asshole in Japan, that's the look. Now to a whitey, obviously that look isn't gonna mean anything. The way that we learn is if we piss somebody off, they punch us in the face. That's kinda how you learn your lesson. In Japan, you're already expected to know your lesson. Failing to adhere to what you already know is disrespectful and dishonorable, and a simple stare will remind you of that, and it will cut you to your core. Those videos were so bad. He has no idea. Hello. Whoa. He jumps onto a moving vehicle and provokes a driver. If a five-year-old did that kind of stuff in Japan, they're going to have a very serious talk with their parents. And honestly, when I look back, when I was like five, I think my nursery school friends, they knew much, much better than him. So I don't know about you, but growing up in Japan, I was taught to be thankful and respectful towards food because there's many people who are involved producing food for you. So you need to be thankful and you shouldn't waste your food. And I still feel bad when I have to throw some food away. So that kind of thing really disgusts me. And he goes on and says things like this. 
I do, I just want to say one thing though. Japanese people are so nice. Literally everyone, first off, they put up with me. Second off, they laugh with me, oh, so, sometimes at me. You know, I really hate it when people say, oh, Japanese people are so nice, when they are actually just taking advantage of the non-confrontational nature of Japanese culture. Just because somebody doesn't yell at you and tell you to get lost, it doesn't mean they like you. In these videos, you can see Japanese people's disgusted faces. As you can see in this video, nobody is laughing and smiling. The owner is completely annoyed. And here's a fun fact. Japan has a conviction rate of 99.9%. That means that 99.9% .9 of criminals that are brought to trial go to prison, or at least given the punishment of their conviction. That is an insanely high number. So it would make you think that everybody who gets arrested in Japan just goes to prison, but it's actually the opposite. Almost unilaterally, 99.9% .9 of cases that go to court are guaranteed convictions. If it isn't what looks like a guaranteed conviction, the court is not going to touch it. Otherwise, criminals are just let off the hook. That said, arrest in the eyes of the Japanese is proof of guilt anyway, so it's not really a good thing. Nothing like, you know, being in the wrong place at the wrong time and having to live with the fact that everybody thinks you're guilty of a crime for the rest of your life. That said, uh, seeing as the police really only exist to harass foreigners, it, you have to be in a really bad luck situation to accidentally get arrested for something you didn't do in Japan. So to have your house raided, get arrested, tried and convicted, and then put on an international pulpit for the world to know that you are a predator has got to be one of the most agonizing, humiliating, and punishing things I could imagine a Japanese person having to go through. We might look at the fine as getting off easy, but we do not have the same social and cultural aspects that the Japanese do. In fact, I guarantee you it's the first thing he thinks about every single day when he wakes up. This is literally seppuku levels of shame. So another question, another thing that people are outraged about, why was Watsuki allowed to continue his work on Rurouni Kenshin's Hokkaido arc? And why is he now allowed to be a part of the new anime? Well, again, Japanese crime and punishment is taken a little bit differently. Short and to the point, once you've paid your debt to society, you're basically done. This doesn't necessarily mean paying the actual, like, literal fine, which, though that helps. Instead, one of the most key things is remorse. A standard Japanese belief is that people are inherently good. When you commit a crime, you are punished, which whether that's jail time or shame or fine, I mean, all of it is very shameful. But afterwards, it's then your obligation to show remorse and then re-enter society and begin to benefit it again. Knowing this, knowing all of the history and of the laws that Watsuki broke and the way that the Japanese treat criminals and the way that the court works, do you see how it all actually kind of makes a lot of sense? It doesn't mean that anything that he did was okay. Obviously, these aren't excuses. Nothing he did was okay, but the way that he was punished is the way that the Japanese punish people. He also came out and apologized. Uh, it's not the best apology of all time, and he openly admitted that he prefers <sighs> girls in late elementary school to middle school, which is... Uh, <sighs> it's super gross, but uh, the honesty is... I don't know, it's something. You definitely wouldn't catch an American admitting to flaws like that. So now that we have the entirety of the historical and the societal and the political and the, the crime and the punishment and the anthropological background to what led to this issue and likely many others, it should be very evident that this controversy um, is incredibly difficult to broach. Is Watsky a monster or is he a product of a country that is lagging to keep up with social modernity? Should he be made a permanent pariah? Should Watsky really shoulder all the blame when his tastes were legal until he was 44 years old? And let's not forget the fact that Japan is still extremely isolationist. The morals of the West play literally no part in the average daily life of a Japanese person.
Watsky wasn't specifically told that what he was doing was wrong until the government mandated it in 2014. And even then, the country of Japan was bullied into it, it bullied into making this stuff illegal by the rest of the world. And these aren't excuses, they're simply facts. The rest of the world isn't held to my standards. In some countries, they eat dogs. In some countries, they wipe their butts with their hands. In some countries, chewing gum is illegal. In some states, you can't get an abortion. But let's be very super duper clear that Watsky's issue isn't a perversion or a fetish, and it, it isn't for anybody else with these proclivities. It is a paraphilia. His preferences are not normal. They're also not preferences. Instead, they are a disorder. But frankly, we're never going to know why he has this disorder and why is often important. It's not going to change what he did. It's not an excuse for what he did, but it does help people understand the underlying issues. Did Japan normalizing his habit help? Probably not. But that said, there's recently been quite a few scientific studies into this specific paraphilia. Considering how amped up the West is over this whole thing, as well as grooming, thanks to, uh, you know, the 17th letter in the alphabet and some crazy, crazy conspiracy theories, it would obviously make sense that scientists and doctors would try to understand this phenomena. And generally what it comes down to is trauma and exposure. Many people with this paraphilia were victims themselves at one point. This results in a stunted sexual maturity, leaving them attracted to people who were their age when they were abused. It's something that they can't help by themselves, and the vast majority of them are what you would call non-offenders, meaning they've never committed an illegal act, at least regarding their paraphilia. So instead, they sit around feeling disgusted with themselves and hating themselves, completely isolated. It sounds like a horribly lonely and sad existence. That being said, there are obviously people who do offend, and those offenders run a serious risk of creating another person with this paraphilia who also could offend in the future. It's a vicious cycle. However, given this particular case, I would like to postulate a hypothesis, which involves Japan's laissez-faire attitude and distribution of this material, specifically during the time that Watsky was growing up. Adult content stars adults, obviously. However, as a kid, it's very difficult to relate to that content when you're seeing it, obviously. It's not uncommon, I mean, if we're being realistic, for youths as young as 12 to start experimenting with looking at this kind of content. But what they're seeing isn't what they look like, it's not what their crushes look like, right? Maybe you have your own personal experience with this. And as we know with all this talk about representation nowadays, having something that represents you would be preferable, and in Japan, it was there. However, these images and experiences consumed at such a young age could possibly leave you with some kind of attachment to them, right? And that could potentially form into a paraphilia as you age. It's definitely stomach churning, but it's just a theory. I don't know. So we may not have an explanation for his paraphilia, but what we do have is Watsky's work. While he has his own problems and disgusting feelings, he also supported an industry that harms children and he also broke the law. He's the author of Veroni Kenshin. Depending on your attitude when you came into this video, you may be wondering why that matters. And the answer is incredibly simple. Veroni Kenshin is a story about being good, about doing good, and primarily and most importantly about redemption, overcoming your past, making up for your mistakes. And what makes these books different is that Watsky's personal issues are not evident at all within them. In fact, there's certain points where his paraphilia is denounced which is weird. This is unlike, say, Made in Abyss, where the mangaka deliberately uses his work to insert his, frankly, disgusting interests, or J.K. Rowling, who uses the money from her books to support evil politicians. While both Made in Abyss, though I could seriously go without some of the artwork, is a next-level story, and Harry Potter is obviously, I mean, like, a cultural and generational phenomenon, both authors are using their work to do the bad. Watsky, on the other hand, created something beautiful and truly innocent. And some of you may have balked at that, but let's not kid ourselves, right? Whether he was creating manga or washing dishes, he would have found a way to feed his paraphilia, okay? He did not specifically make manga so he could buy the bad bad. Also, after his conviction, he shut his mouth and disappeared. Again, 
These are not excuses. This doesn't change what he did. It doesn't take away from the fact that he supported an industry that has ruined the lives of uh, I countless people. I don't know. I don't have statistics on that. I'm probably already on a watch list for making this video in the first place, so I'm not going to look it up. And none of this removes the very distinctive stain on his work and his legacy. And it certainly isn't easy to talk about. Can't wait for the comments. However, knowing what we now know about Japan's views towards redemption and making your way back into society, it's kind of impossible to argue that Watsuki isn't doing exactly that. Regardless of your personal feelings, his manga has helped people. I know that for a fact. So many people have furiously condemned the continuation of Rurouni Kenshin, and I understand. But for the country of Japan, it's arguably the best thing that Watsuki could possibly do. Simply continue to produce a good story with a good message and bring revenue back to the country. Does that make his past disappear? No. But it's something. It's something that isn't reoffending, and it's beneficial to society both culturally and economically. Now, regardless of all of this, people know that I personally love Ravroni Kenshin, so they talk to me about it, and some of them act very ashamed, or they feel bad for loving the story because they know what happened. Lots of them feel like they can't talk about Ravroni Kenshin or celebrate Ravroni Kenshin because of the backlash that they may get online. Some of them go so far as to feel guilty that they bought the manga before they ever knew about Watsuki's crimes, or even before he was arrested. They feel guilty that they supported the guy, they feel guilty that they want to watch the new anime. Honestly, it's really sad. And that's a huge additional crime that Watsuki committed, and that was betraying and hurting his readers. So what to do about this whole situation? Honestly, why ask me? I'm just here to give you information. I broke it down, I explained the nuance, the rest is up to you. My intention here was not to change your mind at all. Like if you came in here with a firm conviction, you're probably going to leave with a firm conviction and that's fine. I'm not arguing for Watsky. I'm just explaining how this all happened, the way it went down and the way that Japan views the entire situation. But if you can't watch and enjoy a video about Roroni Kenshin, then don't. If you want to experience one of the best cultural exchanges from the East and but don't want to support Watsky, there are plenty of ways to get it for free believe me. Or maybe you just don't care and feel like there's no such thing as ethical consumerism, that no matter what you buy, be it gas or furniture or food, it's at the expense of the environment or people, you know? It's exploitation in one way or another. I am not your moral police. I'm not going to virtue signal you guys. But for me, I love Veroni Kenshin. and I'm, I'm not ashamed of it, and nobody's going to make me feel bad for that. I'm upset with Watsky, for sure. Uh, I don't like him very much anymore. Um, like, I don't read the inserts, you know what I mean? But I'm also upset with the country of Japan for making all of this much easier to happen, and probably for the fact that there's like a hundred other mangaka with the same problem that we just don't know about makes it kind of like shitty. But none of this changes what Watsuki made and the good that it's done for people and the good that it will continue to do for people. It's never going to cancel out the financial contribution that he made towards the abuse of children. But Kenshin helped make me a better person. The story it gave me a place to escape during some really tough times in my life. And maybe you feel that way too. And that's okay. But either way, uh, now you know. Hopefully you understand. I know some of this stuff was a little bit complicated, but the choice is in your hands. And I will see you in our Kenshin video. Thanks for watching.